Um, welcome to 26B2, Assessing Water Quality Improvement at the Carly Creek Regional Stormwater Project. Allow me to introduce our speakers. Uh, we have Ron Wiranga, who is the Assistant Director for Clackamas Water Environment Services, where he leads WES's operational and strategic planning for improving water quality and watershed health, pollution prevention, development and industrial wastewater permitting and environmental monitoring. And then we have Leah Johansson, who is a senior civil engineer at Clackamas Water Environment Services. She has been with WES for nearly 14 years working in the watershed group. Leah manages stormwater capital improvement projects, including storm drainage repairs, water quality retrofits and restoration projects. Most recently, Leah has been working on the WES Storm System Master Plan, WES Rules and Standards Update, and the Three Creeks Natural Area Restoration. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, so we're gonna talk to you about a project that we did uh, a, a couple of years ago. Um, we built a, a sort of a retrofit stormwater wetland um, to start out. Chris Desiderati is our primary author on this talk. And as you can see, neither Leah and I are Chris. And, and so he is at home. Uh, he and his wife are expecting their first child any day now. So I didn't make him come to Spokane. Um, I have talked to him. I think he's probably watching and he's probably saying, please don't butcher my, my presentation. Um, so Leah and I, we've modified it a little bit. We are going to talk a little bit more about the construction of the project and then and then walk through some of the, the, the data uh, in our early monitoring um, for this this brand new facility. Um, there's, here's our agenda. Chris wanted to talk a little bit about um, the the graduate program that he did this work under. So I said I would certainly do that for him. Um, we'll talk about the design and construction of the facility. Leo's going to do that, and then we'll get into uh, the monitoring project that we did. I'm really glad we followed. Uh, Jeremiah, because he he touched on a lot of really important concepts. Just want to flag at the up, up front when you're looking at uh, the performance of of stormwater BMPs. Um, there are a lot of similarities, though. So there, so that was was really good. Uh, Chris Chris did this project through the Professional Environmental Science and Management Degree Program at Portland State. Um, it, it generally entails a, a curriculum of, of graduate classes, and a, and a large part of the program is 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 partnering with. A community uh, partner um, to do a project, to do some sort of uh, some sort of graduate project, and and because Chris was an employee of Water Environment Services, um, we were able to sponsor that project uh, and and have them look at look at the the early performance of this of this brand new wetland. Um, also, part of that is is sharing results, uh, which is what this is really about. It's a great program. So, for Water Environment Services, we are a uh, a regional utility. We're, we're a service district and a, and a department of Clackamas County organizationally. Um, we produce clean water and, and protect water quality and recover renewable resources. Uh, we operate and maintain five uh, water resource recovery facilities, 23 pump stations, 360 miles of, of pipe, um, clean more than 7 billion gallons uh, of wastewater every year and, and make also make electricity and natural fertilizer. Um, we also work to reduce pollution in local rivers and streams caused by urban runoff on, on the stormwater side of our house. So our job is to ensure our community enjoys the benefits of health, healthy and safe water. So um, we're, we're going to just sort of skip into project mode. And we, we, we do have a, a, a phase one municipal stormwater permit and a, and a, and a, and a surface water program uh, in, in Oregon, in Clackamas County, which is in the, the southeast part of the Portland um, metro area. Um, but this project is really more, this, this presentation is really more about building stuff and, and how that works. So we're going to kind of skip over stormwater is a problem and how this kind of fits into the context of, of bigger things and, and kind of get right to the details. Um, I've managed stormwater programs in both Washington and Oregon, uh, phase one municipal programs. And so I know that you have different reasons for the things you build. Uh, and there are a lot of things that go into a lot of decisions, factors and goals that go into what you build, where you build it. Um, and a lot of times when we're out there building things, they, they fall on this spectrum, the spectrum of structural controls that, that we build into our system, uh, whether it's new development or redevelopment or um, 
a retrofit. Leah and I do a lot of rehab uh, and construction for gray infrastructure. Um, it has it certainly has its place, um, serves an important role. Um, and we also get to dabble on the green infrastructure side of things where it makes sense. Um, it's definitely an, uh, an area that, that we like to work into, but also you know, is, is suitable for, for certain applications. And this project was really about building um, a, a stormwater treatment wetland and a, to, to manage runoff from a large industrial area falling on the green infrastructure side of the spectrum. So that's what we're, that's what we're gonna talk about today. Constructed wetlands are, um, you know, really sort of mimics of, of natural systems. Um, they're very, they can be very good at regulating runoff volume, um, reducing that volume and reducing peak uh, runoff rates when it comes to a quantity. Um, they also have other benefits, whether cultural or whether it's habitat uh, that, that are, that can be really important to communities as well. Um, so this is why we chose this, this particular application. And I'll turn it over to Leah to talk about the project. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is a project that I've been involved with um, since the very beginning when we were approached by a gentleman by the name of Mr. Carley who owned this property that you can see here in green. So we uh, kind of aptly named the site as well as the creek, uh, Carley Creek. Uh, he was uh, probably in his late 80s at the time. Um, approached us and said, are you guys interested in purchasing this site? And we looked at it. It had been identified in previous studies as a great spot within this uh, industrial commercial basin as a good opportunity for stormwater treatment for a large stormwater treatment facility. Um, so you can see the property is located there. It's in red. It's about 15 acres in total. It borders the Clackamas River and then Carly Creek itself. You can see it's kind of a blue dash line in there that runs through the the property. So we purchased this uh, 2011. And it's another piece to note is that land use in this area also didn't preclude us from building a, a large stormwater treatment facility. So here's what this site looked like when we first bought it. Um, that picture on the upper left is kind of a aerial photo. You can see that big green piece in the middle. That's the old farm field. I think when we bought it, like right in the middle there, where there's rutabagas and some carrots, uh, very flat, great infiltration, which is not great for wanting a wetland to treat the site. So we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, significant bank erosion all along Carly Creek that we wanted to address while we were doing this. Um, tons of invasive species. Uh, it was covered, you can see there in that bottom right picture. Lots of blackberries, lots of Japanese knotweed, pretty much all the things you can think of were on this site when we got it. Um, that picture on the left shows where Carly Creek comes into the Clackamas. Um, PGE found that to be particularly interesting for them for their habitat goals. Um, it's a great cold water refugia habitat. So PGE actually funded the stream restoration portion of this project um, through one of their hydroelectric grant program. So as Ron mentioned, um, this map shows just the large 400 acre industrial area that all the stormwater in this area goes to Carly Creek through two outfalls, um, which are shown on those red stars. There's a outfall that comes in through a 54 inch pipe at the top of Carly kind of starts the Carly Creek, if you will. And then further down, that second star is um, the second outfall, which is at the end of Caps Road. So um, as you might expect, due to the nature of when this was built, there's very little stormwater treatment. So as a result from our water quality sampling, we see um, water quality criteria exceeded for E. coli, copper, lead, and zinc. Um, the other key piece to this is Carly Creek enters the Clackamas River just upstream of drinking water intakes. So there's a large drinking water system that serves over 400,000 people um, within Clackamas County. So we really wanted to kind of treat that water, that stormwater runoff before it got into the Clackamas River. So there's really three big pieces to the kind of the design and construction of this project. You can see there's the existing outfalls that's shown in yellow, the existing pipes and outfalls. We needed to get the stormwater to the site. So we had to build two new diversion structures within the existing outfalls. We were very mindful to keep some base flow in Carly um, since it is primarily stormwater fed. 
we didn't want to cut that off um, and dry up that upper piece. Um, so we targeted kind of the lower first flush, uh, lower flows, but higher concentrations of some of the pollutants we were after. So we put in two new diversion structures. Uh, then we had to build two new, well, two sections of new diversion stormwater pipes, one down 120th, which is on the far right there. And then um, at that second diversion structure at the bottom, um, just after that, we did add a large pretreatment hydrodynamic separator, one of the contact ones, uh, probably the largest I think you had at the time. <laughs> uh, so just some pretreatment before we get the water to the site to kind of get out some of the trash and some of the sediment uh, before it gets onto the treatment terrace itself. And then we did a bunch of work on the creek terrace to kind of convert those very good infiltrating soils uh, into a treatment wetland and did a lot of regrading because it was very flat. So just kind of digging, digging out a bunch of dirt and recreating that. And then again, the creek restoration on Carly itself. So here's some of the details of the actual treatment facility, if you will. Um, after it goes through that hydrodynamic separator, the water comes in and it hits the step pools. And so that does some energy dissipation and then it gets it down to the grade of the site. And then it goes through the first piece is the retention pond and there's a lot of settling that happens there. Another feature to the retention pond is that's easy for us to access um, for maintenance if and when we have to dig it out and get out a bunch of the sediment that's built up. That's an easy spot for us to get to. And then there's a outfall structure at the end of the retention pond and then you can see it gets into the bioretention wetland a very long circuitous meandering path that the water takes to allow for maximum treatment before it then goes out into the Carly backwater channel where the then treated stormwater runoff um, comes back into the Carly main channel before it ultimately ends up in the Clackamas River. So here's some pictures. The first thing we tackled was the stream restoration. We obviously had to work during in-water work windows. Um, some pictures here, you can see the dewatering that occurred, the fish salvage. Um, we added over 300 logs um, into about 83 structures within Carly Creek. And then here's some pictures from building all that new storm infrastructure. Um, the picture on the right is the new hydrodynamic separator that we put in. In the middle is our new stormwater pipe down 120th. Um, that one was up to 20 feet deep in some sections and there was a lot of utility conflicts. So we had to be really mindful that we weren't um, impacting the sewer force main, for instance, that was also in that roadway. And then obviously new manholes uh, shown there on the left. So the farm to wetland conversion, probably the most tricky part of this was that soils management. So when we inherited the site, there was incredible infiltration. Uh, that is not what we want. So what we had the contractor do is as they dug it up, they had to take it to a staging area. They would stockpile all the material and then they would collect samples and send that off to a lab. All the low permeability soils got put back on the site, I think in like 18 inch layers compacted into those wetland cells. Um, Cause we really wanted to try and use as much material that was already there as we could without having to import more um, material for those cells. And then here's just a few more pictures of the creation of the backwater channel. You can see there's a berm there. That's a nice little walking path for us, um, but it also kind of creates the separation from the backwater channel and the treatment facility itself. And then last but not least, we had to replant the whole site. Um, it was over 70,000 plants, a lot of plugs. Um, there were guys out there with augers just putting plugs all over the place. Um, and then we also hydro seeded large sections of that, about five acres of the site we hydro seeded as well. So here's some post-construction pictures of the site on the left is kind of, I think right after we had finished, you can see the vegetation isn't quite grown up, but you can really see how the meandering took shape on the site. Uh, you can see the Clackamas River there on the left and then Carly Creek restoration it's kind of buried and I think you more see the backwater channel. Um, and then the aerial to the right, there's more recent, there's so much vegetation. I was out there 
I don't know, probably a couple of weeks ago and just amazed at the habitat that's come back, the number of birds and wildlife that are using the site. In addition to the stormwater treatment, it's, it's pretty fun. It's a great little site. And with that, I'll give it to Ron. Great, thank you, Leah. Um, yeah, a big, a big part of, as you can see in one of the last pictures, I guess I could go back, the, the Clackamas River is not too far away from this site. It's it's in the floodplain and and part of the infiltration that Leo was talking about, there were for, for some constituents we were concerned about, um, there was some concern over direct pathway right to the river if we just put everything into the ground. So we really needed to, the, the wetland concept gave us a little bit more unit process for, for us to be able to remove some of those pollutants. Um, this is a, basically a conceptual model of, of the, the wetland and this is where Chris started his, his uh, design of his monitoring project. Um, as Leah had just said, uh, this shows how water moves through the site, through our storm system, and into essentially a three series, um, th three, three, three phases of, of the constructed wetland. There's the retention pond, then into the bioretention cells through a, a, um, a flow control structure in the backwater channel. The backwater channel is really um, essentially a floodplain bench it's a uh, off channel storage for Carly Creek. And so when the water comes from through the, the uh, wetland cells them, or the bioretention cells themselves, um, it's met by at high flows water coming directly into that backwater channel from the creek and they sort of meet there and cancel each other out. Um, so that was an important part of the study study design as well. And then you can see the, the processes for pollutant removal um, that we were identifying. So a couple of basic questions for Chris's project. Again, this was a, a, a graduate level project. Um, one of the things when we brought the wetland online was we wanted to get some baseline data. Uh, like Leah said, we had some data from Carly Creek previously that showed some exceedances of things like E. coli and metals um, from Oregon water quality criteria, but we wanted to get uh, another post-construction uh, baseline and take a look at initial performance. It's very new. This study was done um, within two or three years of, of when the wetland came online, which is I think 2018 timeframe. So we wanted to look at some, you know, uh, percent reductions in concentration and mass uh, and mass basis, um, pretty basic stuff. And then also see if we noticed any weather related or other site specific variables that might explain some of that treatment effectiveness. So this is an aerial view uh, of the site as well over on the right is um, again where where Leah had said the stormwater comes into the site. Uh, that's the first monitoring location, um, the influent to the treatment wetland. Uh, the second star there, number two, is where we go from the from the um, retention cell into the bioretention area, um, the wetland area, and then three uh, there on the on the left side of the graphic is is the third monitoring location where it drops down into the backwater channel. That's basically where this BMP is done doing what it does. There's a lot of interaction in that backwater channel and it's pretty complicated to figure out what's going on there. Um, so we didn't really look at that. Uh, the other two sites are in the upper right um, is Carly Creek above site four and uh, Carly Creek below um, the system. So those are our five monitoring uh, locations. Um, this Chris's study went from, you know, it was, it was relatively short in duration. It ran from essentially through a wet season, uh, October to roughly April, he uh, had 14 sampling events, collected samples with um, time proportional composites and grabs for uh, grab samples for, for appropriate pollutants like E. coli. Um, and then we also had some uh, installed a few continuous flow monitoring stations to help with the mass balance stuff. We used precipitation data from one of our, our district precipitation gauges near Milwaukee. Um, and then there's a, there's a Clackamas River um, site there. So this is some of the installation. Uh, that's Chris um, doing a, in, a flow sensor in, in the in the influent um, or the inflow to the to the stormwater wetland um, and a submerged area velocity sensor, and he was able to put that in. Um, and then we set up a couple stations, some stage discharge stations in the creek itself. And then that middle picture is where where the uh, the, the water leaves the treatment terrace. That's site three, and we had another. Um, pressure transducer there so we could look at the flows. Parameters monitored were some basic conventional parameters. Um, we didn't look uh, at too many nutrients uh, in this particular one. We did some inorganic nitrogen and total phosphorus. We didn't look at the, the dissolved phosphorus component, um, looked at a, uh, E. coli and uh, looked at metals as well. 
And where our approach to looking at treatment effectiveness, pretty basic um, concentration percent reduction uh, is one, uh, one approach that we use and then mass percent reduction as well. And, and from an E. coli standpoint, just log reduction. I'm looking for positive log reductions to show removal uh, for E. coli, uh, which is pretty typical. And um, then we also, for the stream sites, uh, we're looking at the Oregon water quality criteria. Um, we can make comparisons there and the International Stormwater BMP database that, that Jeremiah mentioned as well. Um, so this is kind of what a few of the charts I'm gonna show you look like. This is the framework, pollutants kind of go up and down uh, and the sites will stay the same, one, two, three, four, five across. So look out to the right for the Carly Creek sites and then in the middle, um, for the, for the sites within the BMP itself. Uh, the dash lines show some me median concentrations so we can kind of compare the full data sets for the sites. And then uh, some of the colorful stuff like the, the green there will just be shown for site three to, to, to just benchmark against you know some of the BMP data to say, how do we think it's doing? So from a data perspective, um, Looking at E. coli concentrations, we, we certainly did, we, we, like I said before, we did look at log reductions and, and just noting uh, for the group that a log reduction of one uh, corresponds to about a 90% reduction in, in, in organisms. Um, the treatment terrace does seem to have good, good reductions. There are some uh, negative log reductions, uh, but generally it was around from minus 1.3 to three. Um, and we saw that we had positive log reductions about 60% of the time in the samples. Um, for E. coli, uh, the creek and ups, the creek upstream and the downstream sites, the one over, ones over on on the right, you know, we saw slightly lower levels of E. coli on the downstream site, um, and and log reductions ranging from about minus one to one point eight, um, and showing those red lines and the graphs on the right for those two creek sites four and five shows that we generally had um, data or levels of E. coli that were below the Oregon water quality criteria, which is good news. So we get a little busy here, uh, but this is solids. Um, we have total, total suspended solids on the top chart, total dissolved in the middle, total solids on the bottom. And um, generally we found TSS levels, uh, you see them on the top, they were very low. Um, in part that might be due to some of the pre-treatment pre 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 system that uh, we installed. Um, but as in, in something again that, that the previous speaker had said, when you're looking at percent reductions are really low numbers, sometimes you don't get them. Um, uh, so we, we definitely did, um, we, we had relatively low levels of, to of total suspended solids. The medium values for total and dissolved solids were very similar at the sites um, and were lowest at the downstream end of the treatment wetland um, for the most part. Um, and, the, and then concentrations of TSS and, and total dissolved solids were, were below um, benchmarks that Chris used, which was uh, Willamette, some guidance for the Willamette River. And again, this is a, a significant piece of that puzzle is, is what we're able to trap um, prior to the, to the runoff hitting the wetland. Um, another just side note on this one, we, we brought this wetland online in 2018 and three months later had a large industrial fire in the conveyance system uh, upstream of it and got quite a bit of um, diesel fuel and fire suppression flows. And we were able to work with the responsible party and they set up shop right there um, and continually pumped it down. So it was a very effective spill prevention measure as well. It turns out the wetland was fine. Looking at percent reduction of solids, it was generally um, pretty good. Um, the, the, the chart here, the, the top line is uh, concentration and um, the, the, the second line is uh, mass reduction. And this is just for that, so sites one and three, just through the treatment terrace itself. Um, the percent reductions were typically positive uh, look from a TDS and, and total solid, from a dissolved solids and a total solid standpoint. We did have some negative reductions or apparent export of TSS that could have been related to quite a few things, whether they were storm events or um, again, whether they were just low comparing low concentrations of things. Um, but there were, there were a couple uh, negative percent reductions for, for solids. And again, over, overall, from a mass reduction standpoint, um, it's, it's, it's pretty, pretty high. Uh, 
Now, taking a look at metals, again, we looked at zinc, copper, and lead. Um, that's Those are the graphs from top to bottom, zinc, copper, then lead um, in micrograms per liter, because you know, probably, it's probably hard to see. Um, we don't show the median values in these because it makes the chart uh, really busy, but um, the, the levels of metals were pretty low and pretty but pretty consistent among all the sites. So it's a little it was a little challenging to see whether there were any um, significant differences uh, between the concentrations. Um, Carly Creek sites, the ones over on the right, uh, we're pleased to see that they're consistently below the Oregon water quality criteria for metals, um, whether that's an instantaneous criteria or whether that is um, a static acute or chronic criteria, except for a, a couple a couple instances uh, for copper where the chronic um, water quality criteria was exceeded, but um, it does show pretty good water quality in the stream sites themselves. Um, the, the zinc and copper concentrations were highly variable uh, throughout the study and, and um, lead was a little more consistent, but also right at the detection limit uh, throughout, throughout the work. Um, and again, they were generally, our levels were lower than what we saw in benchmarks in the BMP database. So uh, looking at the percent reductions on a, on a concentration basis, um, the good news is we generally see positive reductions in removal of zinc, which is, which is nice. Um, but they also, zinc also tended to have higher influent, con influent concentrations as well. And so that makes sense. Um, copper and lead percent reductions from a concentration standpoint were negative at time in indicating some export potentially uh, from, from the treatment wetland which as Leah had said, this was uh, historically an agricultural field for a long period of time. And then so saturating soil that hasn't been saturated, you know, we do, we, we do expect uh, at least early on for, um, for some export. So it's not, it's not too much of a surprise, but it's certainly something we're gonna keep an eye on uh, as the wetland ages. From a mass standpoint, um, concentration, uh, mass reductions were pretty good um, as well. Uh, but the most interesting thing here, because um, I know I got to speed along a little bit, that we'll note, and I, and I don't have an answer, so I hope nobody asks me why, because we don't know, but we had generally positive uh, percent reductions in mass loads up until a point. And that point was in February 2021, the Portland metro area had a significant ice storm. The town that I live in, in West Lynn, lost almost 2,000 trees. Um, and the wetland was significantly impacted by that as well. Vegetation took a hit. And then we saw export of metals um, after that. It took about a month uh, before we started seeing in, our, in those sampling events, those positive reductions again. So that's uh, something we'd like to look into more, but kind of leads us to believe that, you know, maintaining vegetation in the wetland is very important. So again, age is really important. Um, Chris was able to compare some literature for, uh, for from studies that looked at age of wetlands, and and they're they're all pretty different. Um, some they're they're tough to compare, and in our in our study, the percent reductions from a metal standpoint were were pretty low um, to start out, and so happens. Uh, we'll keep an eye on it. Some of the limitations um, that Chris really wanted to note for this one it was a relatively short study duration. Um, that his rating curves for a couple of the sites didn't have data on the high end, so we might have underestimated some of the peaks, uh, which could impact the mass calculations. Um, storm events weren't specifically targeted. This was sort of basic uh, characterization of water quality at these sites and something in the future that if we actually target storms, we might see some differences in, in pollutant reduction. Again, the wetland is young, so uh, it's going to take some time. And we didn't we didn't study some of the other benefits like the the plant communities and other non water quality benefits. So he wanted to note that's something um, we can look at, and we can because we we basically set up almost a little research station here. All these all these sites are still out here, and and so we, there's plenty of work we can do going forward. So our takeaways, um, you know, we are seeing we are seeing across the board from a mass standpoint percent reductions occurring uh, at the at the terrace um, or in the treatment wetland. Um, and, and serving as a sink for very good reduction of E. coli and, and or a source sometimes potentially when we, we're looking at really low levels of lead and we'll watch that going forward. We do get good total dissolved solid reduction uh, likely just due to retention. We do retain, um, we do infiltrate quite a bit. We just, we slowed the infiltration down but we get a lot of infiltration and, and evapotranspiration. So the, the, the volume reduction was significant. Um, and then ongoing uh, wetland maintenance is, is really important. Chris wanted to note, um, you know, particularly for removal of certain pollutants, keeping that vegetation healthy and happy 
um, and also removing sediment is, is something that's gonna be important for performance going forward. And that is it, that's where we're at. Um, wanna thank you for your time and we can take any questions if you have them. I think there's a microphone coming around. Does the wetland ever dry out? Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, there, this, as Leah had said, most of this watershed, most of this creek basin is piped. Um, and there's a significant amount of, of groundwater infiltration year round. Um, so it does, it does stay wet. It gets pretty low and then and water doesn't move through it very quickly. Uh, and it also gets extremely high where it's almost all water, but it never really dries out. The backwater channel does because the water again is sort of a floodplain bench when the when Carly Creek gets very low in the summer that backwater channel is kind of right up that you see on the sort of the right side of the wetland that that completely dries out. Maybe I got confused, but did you do any sampling upstream of the pre treatment to understand the water quality for the whole treatment system. Yeah, um, no, we, we didn't we didn't sample the storm system above the, the pretreatment device. But as Leah had said, there are, there are two stormwater outfalls that discharge to the upper creek and that station four, that upstream site is basically untreated stormwater runoff. So it, it sort of serves as, as the starting point in, in our minds. It's a good question. You mentioned that you had high infiltration rates at the site. Um, did you, when you put the soil back and compacted it, were you trying to aim for a particular uh, precipitation rate into the soil or were you trying to make it more impermeable? Did you have to have, add a liner for the retention pond? Yeah, no, we didn't add a liner. It was really, you know, the engineers had modeled it at a certain infiltration rate, which just kind of mimicked a D soil, if you will. So like 0.1 inch per hour, I think is what they were targeting. Basically zero infiltration is what it kind of ended up being. Now that the plants are in there, it definitely infiltrates a bit more, but it was, yeah, converting it to very, very low infiltration. Hello. Uh, so I'm wondering if you guys have had any issues with like algal blooms in this area, whether that's something of concern. Uh, you know, we we get some pretty significant growth of like filamentous algae on the surface. Um, we haven't seen much in terms of suspended algae on the site. And again, I think I think with the, I feel like there's well, and you can see it in the data. You can see it in the in the phosphorus and nitrogen data. There's a lot, there's a lot of nutrients there for stuff to grow on, and the plants are kind of competing with the algae. But certainly in some of those cells, um, we get a pretty pretty thick mat of filamentous algae. We'll see we'll see what happens with that over time. I noticed in your last sampling event in April, there was kind of a big spike in total suspended solids coming from site three out of the terrace. Do you know what was going on there? Yeah, uh, we think when well, Chris had said that's somewhat anomalous. He think again, we were using auto samplers and he thinks there was just an issue with the intake on that one. Probably could have removed it, but left it in there. I think, I think he also said there's a pretty low flow event. So um, he thinks there might be some algae in there that that drove the suspended solids up. Good question, thanks. Okay, well, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it.